Now, I just wanted to emphasize on something. I know a lot of you already know, but, you know, I think it's very important for those who don't know or just forget or just try to ignore things, you know, especially for those who might be new or still holding on to the whole slave trade narrative and all that, you know. I have a book here, right? We're in the archive.org where you can find many uh, archives of uh, original uh, scanned copies from prestige libraries and universities, primary sources, even novels, videos, all kinds of things, right? Made uh, for the public, all right? I was able to borrow this book. This book is written by Harold Corlander. So a lot of you already might know where I'm going with this. This book is called The African. It says a novel, the original compelling saga of African American roots. Oh, really? Right? Before anything, right? I just want to go all the way to the back of the book. All the way to the back. All right? And just read a couple of these, of these things because this is the brainwashing that goes on. Now, we already know, we just saw who the Spanish and Portuguese were really enslaving, so touch the hijack. All right? All right? Now, the back of the book says, what does it say? An extraordinary achievement, the Chattanooga Times says, the African is an unforgettable moving story of an African boy, Hunu, who was kidnapped from his homeland by American slave traders. Really, Americans? Born of decades of field research among African and Caribbean peoples, this novel recreates the horrors of the Middle Passage. Oh, really? So it recreates it? So are you saying this is a real story? Hewesuhuno heroic fight for survival while shipwrecked on the island of St. Lucia and the ultimate degradation of enslavement throughout these ordeals. Corlander passionately delivers the African confusion over his plight as well as his captors' ambiguities and rationalizations over enslaving their fellow men. Aww. Alright, so yeah, they gave that crazy review. Now this is crazy because you're going to see why. Alright, now let me just show you this other Right, it says, first published in 1967, The African has sold more than 300,000 copies, was translated into several languages, and was a proven primary source. A primary source for what? For Alex Haley's? Who's that? Pulitzer Prize winning Roots? What is that? That movie? Wait, that movie Roots? You mean Kunta Kinte? You mean this is his primary source? Oh, this must be some real shit right here then. This book must be really scholarly. Damn, this is his primary source for the movie, Roots, about an African be being brought to the Americas. It says, now available in a handsome paperback edition with a new preface by the author. The African presents an engrossing storyline embodied by powerful characters who provide an insightful journey through the volatile frontiers of American slavery. Oh, really? All right. Uh, must be Indians then because we just saw right they must be talking about aboriginal American Indians right who are they talking about because they keep saying African I'm a little confused here now it says Harold Corland is a novelist folklorist and specialist in the oral traditions of African and Caribbean cultures really he's a specialist he was he has written more than 35 books including the best selling the cowtail switch and other West African stories and the drum and the hoe life and lore of the Haitian people Man, this guy's old. All right, I guess he's an expert, right? Says so the reader comes away from the African believing this is what it must really have been like. Oh my gosh, so what is he doing? He's making people really, really believe in the whole African slave trade, right? The whole Middle Passage. This is by Publishers Weekly. That's what they're saying. Strikingly successful, the Atlantic Monthly. This novel of tremendous movement proportions, Corlander writes with deep understanding. Oh, really? Man, I'm, I'm, Corlando must have done his research. Man, a straightforward and shocking account. It's shocking, the Providence Journal. All right, so man, he got some good reviews, right? And it's Alex Haley's primary source for his movie Roots. Really? All right. Now, the only problem with this, I need you to understand this, and I'm going to zoom into it. All right. This is not a conspiracy. This is not a theory. All right. This book, this story is a fictional story. It's fiction. This is a fictional book. So how's this shocking? What do you mean he did? Uh, he had deep understanding. 
What are you talking about? This is a fictional story. Wait a minute. Alex Haley's primary source was a fictional story? A fictional story? What? Kunta Quinta's not real? But wait a minute. I thought he I thought he had descendants and everything in America. Like, what's up? Alex Haley. I thought Alex Haley's... <laughs> oh my gosh. Brilliantly presented. Oh yeah, you definitely did it well to fool everybody. You did a great job. That's why he got all these awards. Right? Just want to read a little bit of what the author says. Alright. Now I want to see this little paragraph right here. Look what he says. It says the African was written in the mid 60s by which time I had been deeply immersed in the study of African Caribbean and African American cultures it was not researched look it was not researched in parentheses he's letting you straight up no in the usual sense everything was up there waiting for me to use it it was just it just came to him when the idea came to me I told you when the idea came to me that there should be a story such as this one I reflected quite a while on what form it should take I had never read a novel about enslaved Africans that encompassed what I had to say and therefore had no models. So there's no records, there's nothing that existed before he actually wrote that about a middle passage. There's nothing like that. There wasn't no stories like that because it wasn't real. He didn't have nothing to go off. He's telling you no models. But one morning, but one morning, listen, I just sat down at my typewriter and began. He just started re writing some hijack <laughs> narrative of history he just had an idea he sat down and just started writing with no research with no sources all right another writer will understand me if i say the narrative seemed to write itself it just wrote itself really or did they put you onto this and make you a best-selling author so you can sell a fake lie of history so you can continue to lie to the aboriginal people of the americas because you already had taken all their land mostly and already had misclassified all of them as Negro color. All right. And I simply went along with it as a companion wherever it led. He just went wherever. He just took it wherever. He went extreme with it. He made this story up. By the time the book was finished, I had the feeling that Hue Suhuno, later called Wes, was a real person who had shared himself and his life with me. So he got possessed by a fake person, he says. He made him real. He wrote the book so good, the story, that he made this person real. This is Alex Haley's primary source of fictional story that this guy didn't do no research on. He's letting you know. All right, and then it goes on to the fake story right away. All right. I don't care to read this lie. Because you know what? We just went over what? What happened to the American Indian? We just went over all that information over an hour of the real cruelties of real history. And you want us to focus on a fake history? You want us to pity something that didn't really happen? When something really happened over here. All right, a real Holocaust, real atrocities, real so-called slavery, slave raids, these expeditions, right? These explorations were slave expeditions. The Spanish and Portuguese were conducting here in America. Now, let me just read this. I found this. All right, it says, Kunta Quinta struggled to be African. Kunta Quinta. All right, this is from the Phylon. All right, this is from the uh, Clark Atlanta University. All right, Review of Race and Culture. All right, Volume 47. Now, we got an online article here. It says, by Harold Corland, the Kunta Quinta struggled to be African. Now, it says... It is almost a decade since the publication of Alex Haley's Roots, and in the public view, at least controversy generated by the book appears to have worn itself out. There no longer seems to be the sense of immediacy about answers to serious critical challenges, nor is there any clear measure of how those challenges might have affected the public image of Roots. The questions raised were numerous. For example, Haley's fact-finding trip to Gambia. Was he told only what his informants knew he wanted to hear? You hear this? Or did he manipulate what he heard? And about Kunta Quinte, on whose existence the whole saga hangs, was Kunta really captured in the manner described by Haley? Alright, look what they're asking. 
And did he really make the Atlantic crossing on the Lord Ligonier? It's a fictional story. No, he didn't. Was the slave named Toby on the Waller Plantation really the same person as Kunta? No, it's a fictional story. And how much or little of the narrative was history, as the publisher stoutly proclaimed it to be, and how much was fiction? How much is history? How much is fiction? Let's say 98% of it is fiction. 2% meaning that it happened here in America. Many such questions have in fact been answered, but whatever meanings they may have had for the community in general, roots continue to be read and quoted. All right, roots is still used as a source and it's a fiction. It's found everywhere on library shelves. It's a cornerstone of various black study programs. And also, right, who uses it always? Uh, Pan-Africans. This is how they try to program us when we were little in school by putting the school in us, um, this movie in, in our heads, these ideas. And by some, both black and whites is considered to be a milestone in nurturing of black self-awareness in America. Really? A fictional story. See how bad they got us? In short, the book has an established place in contemporary American literature and will be spoken of no doubt for some time to come. Yet what struck me forcibly in numerous readings of Roots is how un-African, his un-African Kunta is most of the time and the extent to which Haley unwittingly derogated the ideal he sought to celebrate. Kunta's behavior, perceptions, and explanations of self frequently are untrue to African personality, African knowledge of people and the world around them, African technology and capability, and the disciplines and sophistication of most African societies. All right, so he wasn't even African. He was he didn't act. He didn't, you know. So you know why? Because it's a fictional story, right? So get the article. All right, keep reading it. It's really good. It goes on to saying how garbage it is. Really, it just keeps complaining. All right, we're in the Chicago Tribune. All right. Dot com. It says Alex Haley's facts can be doubted, but not his truths. All right. It says Alex Haley died last year, but the trashing of his memory continues apace. Alex Haley hoax. Alex Haley's hoax. How the celebrated author faked the Pulitzer Prize winning roots screamed the front page headline on February 23rd Village Voice. You hear that? He hoaxed everybody. The author, Philip Noble, charges after sifting through Haley's archives at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville and after interviewing some of the sources Haley cites, that Haley bent facts or stole passages from start to finish to produce the stirring saga that became a record-smashing hit television series and a cultural milestone of modern American race relations. All right, you hearing this? Haley's offenses are so egregious. Nobel says that the Pulitzer board should Potumously take back the prize it presented Haley in a special award category in 1977. Instead, Noble charges his story as being blacked out, or if you prefer, whited out, by major media to frighten and guilt ridden to pick up his crusade. All right, you see what's going on? He got a Pulitzer Prize for this fictional story. He's saying he showed the survey, he plagiarized, and he bent facts, he altered stories. Not surprisingly, Haley's defenders have lambasted Noble's lengthy report as a racist attack on black intellectualism and cultural heroes. All right. So it keeps going. All right. A hoax. All right. Chicago Tribune. I want to continue with a video, a news clip, right, about, you know, Roots and in the new series, right? I want to see how, I want to show you how brainwashed people still are and how they're still pushing this on us right now. We don't even question it. We don't even, yo, stop telling us lies. Stop broadcasting this like it's a real story. All right. So, I mean, it's sickening. Like, for real. All right. And uh, so, you know, it's they try to get to your emotions. All right. So now look, look at how they got everybody. All right. And look at the impact they had on everybody during that time when it came out in 1977. It was, by every measure, epic. The made-for-television miniseries, Roots, which aired right here on ABC in 1977. A record 85% of American households watched for a perspective that's more than have ever watched an Olympics or a Super Bowl. For the first time on TV, it was a very human story of slavery, what's been called America's original sin, told from the slave's perspective. Now, a new version of Roots for a new generation premieres next week. 
roles in television history cast a longer shadow than Kuta Kinte. The African boy who became an American slave in Roots. I opened my eyes and I was here. Number nine, so. A record 130 million people tuned in, a milestone for our nation. You name Tobin. A looking glass of sorts at the degradation of slavery. What's your name? Kunta. Kunta Kinte. And the dignity one man, one family reclaimed. There could be another day. So Roots was a seminal event in our nation's history. Actor LeVar Burton was just a 19-year-old college kid. Good to never forget you. When he got the role of his life. The story had never been told before from the point of view of the Africans. You are Kunta Kinte. Now, almost 40 years later, Kunta Kinte and Roots are back. Reimagined and remade by the History Channel. The new cast full of Hollywood star power, but the starring role, Kunta Kinte, played by British newcomer Malachi Kirby. Never let them put the chains on your mind. One of the biggest things that I took from playing Kunta Kinte is where his strength came from was in knowing where he was from. Gandhi Balongo! Toby! 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 Good. It's been a long time coming, this moment. Yeah, man. <laughs> Kirby and Burton, who originated the role, first met on set in Africa. It's an important story. It is an important story, Malachi. Yeah! Burton is the co-executive producer of the new series, and the two men formed a close bond. To be given the opportunity to portray him is a huge responsibility. I can't imagine doing what it is he did in terms of... But you did it first. I, yeah, but it's, it's easy to be the first in that sense, because then no one has anything to compare you to. Much like the character he plays, Kirby found inspiration by drawing on his own roots. This felt very much like my story. My last name is Kirby. I'm aware I'm from Africa, but my last name is not African. When it first aired, the country seemed to stand still for eight days in January 1977. An unheard of 85% of American households caught a part of the series. I think it's important that you saw this picture. Sparking debate in classrooms and in homes. Like, the black people know we're trying to accomplish that men are equal. It rocked us. It tore the, the blinders off. We could not go back to the way we were before. So I remember I went to a predominantly white high school, and I was pissed going sure. to school. Sure. In Roots. And we had to work through that. You had to work through that. The series had such an impact, many of the characters' names made it on to real birth certificates. Is it? Behold, the only thing greater than yourself. I wanted to name her Ebony. He said, no, Kizzy. Kizzy, the name of Kunta's daughter. The name Teresita and Carlos Gonzalez, a young immigrant couple living in New York in 77, decided to give their own daughter. I love it. <laughs> I think it's powerful. I think it's impactful. Powerful how? Powerful because just like Kizzy, my family's here. You know, just like Kizzy, I uh, am deep-rooted in the uh, commitment to family, I instill it in my children, so, you know, um, it's powerful in that sense. Kizzy now married a mother of two. This is how I heard about the boy, Kunta Kinte. We brought the entire family in for a private screening of Roots. The pain of the miniseries, the pride it revealed, all remembered. It's always hard to watch, but it, it is a lot to learn from. For this family and many others, Anika Noni Rose is Kizzy in the remake. If you ever touch just one, I'll kill you. The key to that is continuing to shed light, continuing to tell truth, continuing to correct mistruths, and continuing to listen. I'm a fair man, Kizzy. You know that. Jonathan Reese Myers plays the slave owner, Tom Lee. You're going to be my good luck charm. Roots may be a story that took place 150, 165 years ago. But all it is is a political mirror as to what we are doing today. The other starring role, Chicken George, portrayed by another newcomer, Reggae Jean Page. You crave wonderment, jubilation, revelation, woo glory! That's what you came to see! There's not a single person I encountered on set who did not want to get this right, who did not feel it was important to get this right. It was never just a job. It was so much bigger than that. And from his watchful gaze as we spoke to the cast, 
Burton seems confident the story is in good hands. Here's a question that I can't imagine anyone better suited to answer than you. Why? Mm. Why remake this classic? Because there was a whole new generation of, of kids out there for whom the original was old and was dated. And so in order for them to get the, the power of the story, it had to be retold for them in a language that they could understand. The power of this uniquely American story, the lessons learned, and those still to come. I think that's the value of storytelling. It helps give us a context for who we are, why we're here, and what we're doing while we're here. All right. So, I mean, damn, you saw, I mean, you see all the propaganda. They still even got a miniseries and they're promoting it like it's real. The, the actor, the main actor from the first movie, he's like, oh, man, just telling the story. What story? This fictional story? What are you talking about? You think he doesn't know? What is he, an agent? These are all agents. What's up with these people? Maybe that young dude don't know. He's just following. He's an African. I mean, I don't know. But I don't know who if he's down. I don't know if he's a Mason. I don't know. He's in the secret order or whatever. But you know, they're lying. All these people are lying. They're such liars. They're still trying to get into your emotions. They're trying to brainwash you so you don't fight back for your land. All right. We already saw who the Spanish and Portuguese were were enslaving and we got many more records i didn't even show all my videos because i got more info on like the uh, uh origin of america uh, uh video i think it brought over four thousand four thousand indians as slaves to south america to replenish the slave population it wasn't africans these were american aboriginals they were enslaving and that's wrong that they would try to cover this and, and, and create a whole fake fictional story and promote it more and more and more. Why don't they do a whole production of what really happened? Why don't they do a series of what really happened? You understand? Ah, oh, man. And you still pushing this, man? You still use this as your source, primary source of fictional story? All right, so we're in the New York Times website. And this is an article they wrote in 1978 by Arnold H. Lubach. All right, fair use. This is the article, and it's on this section of the article right here, down the bottom. Roots, plagiarism, suicide. You can actually subscribe to this and get the original. But why if I got it digitalized right here? And you can verify it. We already know it's true. All right, so it says, Alex Haley settled the lawsuit yesterday by acknowledging that his world-renowned book, Roots, contains some material from a relatively unknown novel about slavery that was published nine years earlier. The settlement ended six-week trial of a suit by Harold Corlander, a 70-year-old author from Bethesda, Maryland, all right, who contended that there were substantial similarities between Roots and his own earlier novel, The African. Now, it says he sued in federal district court in Manhattan for more than half the profits of Roots, more than half the profits of Roots, as the trial was about to reach climax with summations by the opposing lawyers, they issued the following statement. The suit has been amicably settled out of court. So Alex Haley was like, oh man, I'm about to get exposed big time and this is going to go viral in those times, whatever way it could, right? So he's what he did is he contacted him and said, yo, 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 let's just settle with how much money you need. Alex Haley acknowledges and regrets that various materials from the African by Harold Corlander found their way into his book Roots. He had to admit that, that he plagiarized this fictional story that you still believe in. Under the agreement to settle, the amount of money that will be paid to Mr. Corlander and his publisher, Crown, was not disclosed. But the nature of the case made it seem likely that the amount would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. All right. He got sued for this fictional story he, he plagiarized. All right. History News Network. All right. Dot org. It says in the 101 year history of the Pulitzer Prize, only one award has ever been returned and or revoked. On April 15, 1981, two days after conferring the 1980 feature writing prize on Washington Post reporter Janet Cook, the board received a telegram from the paper's executive editor, Ben Bradley, stating that Cook had declined the award and re-signed. Re she told Post editors early this morning that her story about an age-old heroin addict was in fact a composite that the quotes attributed to a child were fabricated and that certain events described as eyewitness did not in fact happen. The members of the 1981 board were polled by telephone and the award was officially withdrawn. 
The 1977 board faced a similar situation with another prize winner who was likely, likewise accused of making up people who never existed and events that never occurred in his best-selling book. This time the board did not withdraw the award, nor would successive boards when the same writer was tarred with mounting evidence of plagiarism and fraud in the same book. Nobody wanted his ass, cracked Bradley, a member of the perennial segregated board. He was speaking of Alex Haley's roots, all right? A giant hoax whose untarnished Pulitzer standing continues to sully the ethics and honor of the organization. And you see, and because of that, he's still getting miniseries. Nobody, this is not exposed. He's not being clowned. He's not being exposed to the major. He's not being embarrassed, put out there. Why not? Why is this not news to tell you that that was a fake story? On April 18, 1977, Haley's monumental 1976 bestseller was lionized with a special award. The citation read for Roots, the story of a black family from its origins in Africa through the seven generations to the present day in America. You see, they gave him an award for a... Damn, this upsets me so much. You know, they gave him an award. And they said, why? Because it's the story of a black, so-called black or crayon color family and origins in Africa. We've debunked all this. Are you saying that all these fame professors and all these intellectual people can't do the research that I did and see that that we didn't, you know, most so-called blacks in America did not originate in Africa? All right, they're talking about seven generations. It's a lie. They gave him a special award for that, for lying, because they knew that he had brainwashed everybody. This is an agent. This was this was created on purpose. There's a weapon they used against you. The board's announcement came eight days after a front page New York Times story, following up on a London Sunday Times exposed debunked Haley's historic African genealogy. All right, and a copyrighted article by Mark Ottaway, the Sunday Times said that investigations in Africa and examinations of British colonial records and Lloyd's shipping documents indicated that Mr. Haley had been mistaken or misled in his African research. They actually went to verify. Listen to this. You've never heard of this. All right. There appeared to be no factual basis, the article said, for Mr. Haley's conclusion that he had actually traced his genealogy back to Kunta Quinte in the village of Yufuri, Cambia, and that Kunta Quinte had been captured by slavers in 1767. It's fake. It never happened. Why? We already know he got the story from the African a fictional book. He plagiarized. He had to admit to. Of course it's fake. The account of Kunta Kinti, it said, was provided by a man of notorious unreliability who knew in advance what Haley wanted to hear and who subsequently gave a totally different version of the tale. Oh, man. They went and investigated. You see, they don't expose this. The 1977 board ignored the Sunday Times' devastating refutation of Haley's African field work. So go ahead and look into that. Sunday Times, all right, they exposed this dude, all right, and they nobody nobody listened to it. They ignored it. Why? Because he's protected by the elite, man. They want to push this African thing on you. All right. On December 14, 1978, Haley Haley admitted plagiarizing *The African*, a slave novel by prolific folk, folklorist Harold Corlander and Roots, and paid six hundred and fifty thousand worth two million five hundred eighty thousand today to make the copyright infringement case go away. On the eve of the uh, of the judge's decision, a page one New York Times story reported, Alex Haley settled a lawsuit yesterday by acknowledging that his world-renowned book roots contained some material from a relatively unknown novel about slavery that was published nine years earlier. All right, so we got that already, that article. All right, so it says the 1979 board took no action on Haley's massive piracy. On February 23rd, 1993, a year after Haley's death, the Village Voice published my 9,000 word analysis of Haley's private papers and tapes bequeathed to the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. From these materials emerged a picture of an irredeemable literary scoundrel who polluted black history and genealogy. He's a scoundrel, scammer, liar, liar, agent. He polluted what? So-called black history, aboriginal history, and genealogy, making fun of all your genealogy and history. They're disrespecting it. 
with an avalanche of lies, an avalanche of lies and roots, all of Haley's ripping yarns about his search for Kunta Quinte and his 10 year struggle to write roots were part of an elegant and complex makeup as you go along scam. It was a scam. They scammed you. They scammed all of us. One stunning example, a reel to reel tape on file at UT, revealed that Roots' climactic sacramental tear soaked scene with an imposter, Cambian Gryon, oral historian, who confirmed the existence of Haley's 18th century slave answers to Kunta Quinte was a charade. It was fake. They even made somebody say it was real. They paid somebody over there in Africa to say, yeah, yeah, it, that's my ancestor. It was a charade. It was all fake. Remember, they did a Sunday Times investigated. It was fake. The Griot recited no lineage of the Quinte clan as worship fully portrayed in roots. Instead, Haley fed him a few pre-arranged questions and the Griot replied with answers ma ma massaged by Haley's Gambian government's associates. All right. You better say this or we're going to kill you. As long as he lived, Haley apparently never let anyone hear the tape. All right. Nobody ever heard the tape. He was like, yo, say this, hey, say this. This time around, the 1993 board dealt with roots in its, in its fashion. And my urgent Sherman Clark sit and opened the door to review of Haley's price. He distributed the voice piece to board members and placed the matter on the annual meeting agenda. But no discussion ensued. Sitton's colleagues, including Harvard philosopher Cicela Bug, Desmonius Register editor Geneva Overholster, and New York Times columnist Russell Baker, unanimously declined to reconsider Root's status. They're like, no, man, we need that to stay, the, the, to be the actual story. We need, we don't need to tell people that was fictional or give back this award. Imagine if they gave back this award, that would make news, and then people would be like, well, why are they giving this back? And then they make you question. Your emotions will go off again. Everybody will kind of it will it will wake a lot of people up. All right. How many people watch my videos? Not everybody's gonna see this info. All right. You get what I'm saying? So they keep it from the from the mass mass public. Right. They keep it away. The hardest hit on Haley bona fides came from Harvard professor and 2006 Chair Henry Louis Gates in his role as general editor of the canonical Norton anthology of african-american literature 1996 gates took the extraordinary step of denying an entry for the first black male pulitzer winner in effect he annihilated haley's legacy in the legitimized roots prize you see he would have got that <laughs> he would have been known as the very first so-called black pulitzer prize winner but since it was fake this guy who actually owns that who gives these awards all right, who has this Norton anthology of African American literature? He said, "No, you're fake. In fact, you're you're a scam." All right, humiliated him. All right, he said, "Let's speak candidly." Candidly, he made plain in the Boston Globe. Most of us feel it's highly unlikely that Alex actually found the village from whence his ancestors sprang. Roots is a work of the imagination, rather than the strict historical scholarship. All right, all right. So it keeps going. Hey, man. So. We already know it's fraud, right? So down here it says, nevertheless, as Harvard historian and 1954 Pulitzer winner Oscar Hanlon observed of roots, a fraud's fraud. A fraud, it's a fraud. All right, it's a fraud. Most historians are cowardly about reviewing history books. The whole idea of being factual about material has gone out the window. Historians are reluctant, cowardly about calling attention to factual errors when the general team is in the right direction. That goes for foreign policy, for race and for this book i think it's a disgrace foreign policy it's a policy they have to make you believe you're still african they have to still make you believe you're an african all right man they go into so much deep search research right here all right it goes it, it's a lot all right so i'm gonna just leave it there all right but it's just i just wanted to show you in case you didn't know how deep this went it's all fake it's all fake and they pushed it on you and they're still pushing it on us today. All right, break the spell.